Everybody, this is Brian back with an episode, another episode of Grief to Growth. And I've got with me today Amira Hall. And uh, Amira's got a fascinating story. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about her and then we'll, we'll have a little conversation. She blends sacred with science and she's been on a four decade journey of exploring uh, secrets to manifesting and healing. She's the gift of clairvoyant. She's a spirit medium. She's a channel and she's a quantum healing pioneer. Her own spiritual awakening was triggered after her father's death, after her divorce and life threatening autoimmune disease, all within a six month period. It was further amplified with an NDE while she was traveling in Egypt when her gifts of psychic vision, channeling, and mediumship opened up. She has a reputation as being a world-class psychic, mystic, and mentor. She has her master's in metaphysical science, and she's an ordained minister dedicated to providing spiritual tools and guidance to seekers going through their ascension process, reaching higher levels of awareness and healing. And so with that, I want to welcome to Grief to Growth, Amira Hall. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. It's lovely to be with you, Brian. Yeah, I'm really interested in having this conversation with you today. It sounds like you've got a really interesting uh, story. That is how you got to where you are today. Yeah. I do interview a lot of people who have NDEs, and we talked about INs. We both have some association with that. So if you don't mind, I'd like you start maybe by telling me about your near-death experience. Okay, I'd love to. Um, you know, it's interesting because I was listening to a number of conversations that you've had with your other guests, and it seems like um, we we all have many near deaths almost. And some of them, I, I know even with the grief process, there are like many deaths of who we are, but I never associated them with deaths. Mm. It wasn't until I went on a spiritual journey in Egypt and I had an amazing, incredible, spiritual, expansive experience in two weeks of Egypt. And um, what I did was I was a jewelry designer at the time and I wanted some treasures to take back with me and incorporate in my work. So I found this, I guess you could say it was a little factory. It wasn't like they made beads. It's just that they had a house that was perched on the back of the Valley of the Kings in Egypt outside Luxor. And so what these, these local people in Egypt were doing is they were digging into the mountain in the back of their house. So the back wall was, a, when you walked in, it would be a big carpet covering the wall. Mm -hmm. And really there was a hole there into the mountain. They were digging tunnels, trying to find treasures. So when I found this out, I figured, okay, these would be people that would most likely over the years have found a collection of little, you know, treasures. <laughs> so that's how I found them. And I did find some beads and I didn't have the money. I had to go back to the ATM and return to pay them. So when I did that in Egypt, it's, it's quite a uh, ritual when you buy something there. And especially if they're friendly, you don't just pay and leave. You visit, you have a, a Coca-Cola or you'll have some hot tea or or they'll exchange water and you and stories and what well because I was with a friend they brought in the special stuff for me and it was a joint. And I said, well, no, thanks. I don't smoke. And my God, it erupted into this Arabic, you know, shouting match. <clears throat> Mohammed, the owner of the of the joint, pardon the pun. <laughs> <laughs> Um, he he was insulted, okay, because that's against your the way to refuse the host's offering. Hmm. And so I went shouting and shouting and shouting, and he's saying, it's the best, it's the best. And I'm like, yeah, but no thanks. You know, give me a light beer and I'd be happier. But of course they did, they weren't, you know, they don't drink alcohol. So uh, they, they brought out the joint. Then I thought, well, you know, I've smoked pot a few times in my life and never really did anything. And quite honestly, that's why it never took for me, right? It's just like, take it or leave it. You know, it's not something I'm interested in. So I thought, well, I'm the only female here. I was the only American. And all of a sudden, about eight, 10 guys showed up from nowhere. And there was this room full of people. And I just thought, well, we'll just pass it around and nothing will happen, right? Because nothing happened in the past. So they started passing this joint around and it did come by me twice. I did inhale and everybody bounced up when the joint was finished and they were ready to go on their way. Well, that didn't work like that for me. I found myself pinned to the chair and I couldn't get up. When I found myself standing behind myself and, and observing, it was like there were 10 television screens with everybody's life and movie playing on it. And, and I was starting to see these entities or beings coming towards me. The whole thing was such an overwhelming space. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, I, I, can't, I can't leave. I can't leave my body. I, I've got to stay here. So I remember I had my hands out here. I don't remember 
going through the motion of doing it. It was like I was coming in and out behind myself and then back. And I got my hands in front. I don't know if I said I need water. And all I could think about was if I just could splash my face with some water, then I'll stay in my body. It'll, you know, bring, bring my attention, my body awareness back. Mm -hmm. Well, that didn't happen either. I remember getting right here and thinking, oh shit, my mascara is going to run. <laughs> it's just like, oh, such vanity in the moment of death. But yeah. I, I had no sense of I'm dying, just like I'm leaving my body. Hmm. And, and then I was gone. So in that moment of time, um, they told me that my body stiffened. I fell out of the chair. They were pounding my chest with all their might. So there was no uh, medics, okay? We're in a village outside of Luxor in Egypt. And so they pounded my, my chest with all their might. They dragged me under the arms, propped me into a truck, barreling down the road. They had my head propped out the window, giving me oxygen, okay? So, so I try to see the amusement in the story as, as in retrospect, right? So again, I was knocked out. I was unconscious. And the, then the conscious moment that I had was I was shooting through the, the sky. It was a dark sky. And I saw stars and I could see this little ball, blue ball way off in the distance. And I'm like, that's where I'm going. And it kept getting bigger and bigger. And, and I was going faster and faster. And I'm like, oh, uh, that's a big place. How am I going to find myself? So it was like my soul trying to find my body. Hmm. It was almost like my soul's GPS going beep, 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 beep. Where am I? Hmm. When I, and then I said, like, I don't know where I am. And I heard Arabic or I heard this language I didn't know. And then the next thought was, oh, I, I left myself in Egypt. So then I, um, I, I remember finding my body was like trying to put on a wet, wet suit, hmm. like, or wet clothes. Have you ever done that before? Hmm. It's like, it's nasty, right? And it takes a lot of time and pushing and engaging and took a lot of effort. And it was, it was almost painful to come kind of get back into my body. Um, I couldn't open my eyes. The light outside was too intense and bright as I was coming back into the body. And then I remember sort of feeling my way. I could hear the voices in the truck. But at the same time, all I could feel was my bowels are, are speaking to me here and I need a toilet, right? So keep in mind, we're in a village. And, and this was in 1998. So things were pretty rudimentary. And the Egyptians in the village, they didn't have proper toilets. So this becomes another issue because all I'm thinking is, oh, I need a toilet. And my friend, when I patted him, I said, where are you taking me? And he says, to the hospital. And he's, he's screaming in Arabic. He forgot he's going back and forth in English. He can't, he's so stressed out because he's realized that I don't speak Arabic and, you know, his mind is, is just waffling. So I said, no, I need a, I'm not thinking a hospital in, in the village in Egypt. Oh my God, a place like that's going to kill me. <laughs> so yeah. it was like, oh my gosh. And so they found his brother's flat and they had to carry me up three flights of stairs where um, I was then brought into the, into the bathroom and I wouldn't let him leave me. And he was sitting on the edge of the tub. I'm properly with my long skirt over my knees. I'm thinking, you know, I'm just. I, I'm very discreet. I'm looking proper, but um, he, tears were just streaming down his face because I'm in this total state of bliss. And he's just like, you do not understand. Hmm. You do not understand. He goes, you died. And so the, the importance of all that was not so much that, I mean, in Egypt, a year before there was a massacre in 1997, where the government then put new regulations. So any American, anything that happened to any American... Uh, the Egyptians would be in jail and their families, they would lose all their business, everything. So their family business supported maybe 50 people, right? Mm -hmm. And so this was a crisis for them at the same moment in a big way. Yeah. So it was quite a while before I could walk. And uh, then when I was um, on his on the bed, just relaxing and trying to get my strength back, they brought me water and juice and yogurt they sensed I had dehydration because that is a common thing for Westerners in the heat. And mm. 
And um, so, but what was happening was I was starting to see in the armoire, there was a wooden armoire across the bed, the end of the room. And I started seeing this figure in the armoire and it was Sekhmet. She's the goddess. She's got a, I've got one right here. She's the lion face goddess with a female body. And I'm like, I am, I can't look at that. That is not real. And I kept looking out the little window that with the fluttering draperies out to the Nile Valley thinking, that's real. I'm going to keep looking at that. That's my reality. Whereas every time I kept straight, there she was. So it was a while later. <clears throat> it took me like three or four hours before I could walk. I had to fly home that day. And I flew home. Uh, probably it took six to eight hours before I got to Cairo. And then there's an eight hour flight to New York. When I got off the flight in New York, I saw everybody as a walking, flat, two-dimensional paper doll. And that absolutely horrified me. Mm. So Brian, it's a, it seems to be a long drawn out story, I know. And um, this continued, the horror that I felt with those two-dimensional images was that I was coming back to a state of grief and anger and depression and hatred. It was a vibration that I was stuck in for about nine months. Mm. And I couldn't understand, like, I, I was moving and coming back to the land of paper dolls. And I was separated from that, but then I became part of it. And I realized, to my horror, that I too was living in the land of paper dolls. And so I guess you could say my grief was stuck and whatever happened where I went, because the story continues, where I started to download where I went and the information from my NDE, because I was, I was pissed off, one pissed off girl, like, where's Jesus in my NDE? You know, I was like, you know, where's my coming to Jesus moment? So seeing that light in that way, in that moment in time, didn't happen. And could it have been like in my own discovery and process, it was like something came into my energy space while I was trying to come back into my body. And even in working with people that have, uh, well, grief does that. It sort of tears a, a part of our energy space, our frequency, our chakras, and then other beings and entities can come in, whether it's, a, a, let's say, somebody else's depression or somebody else's energy. It could have been that I was so wide open when I stepped into New York that all that foreign energy, I call it grief and anger, but it was foreign to me. So it was a heavy, heavy lower vibration. Does any of that make sense? Because it's it's sort of like a compilation of a lot of different possibilities and yeah. and no for sure, no absolutes. Right. Well, I, I you did have some trauma before this experience, also, right? The, the the passing of your father and your that happened. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you. You know, in reflection, by the time I was twenty, I had been to twenty funerals. Oh wow. Okay, so I was raised Catholic and I and there was a, from a big family, but friends and friends, parents and but family members, cousins and uncles. And I had two uncles that had committed suicide, um, you know, and just been around a lot of death. But at the same time, I was always super sensitive. And when I look back, I think, was I super sensitive and absorbing these foreign energies, whether we call it grief or depression? I, I like to call it just a lower frequency. And when I started to understand the quantum mechanics or physics of who we are and how, how we interact with our world, I started to understand that we match energy. Mm -hmm. And when we're vulnerable for whatever emotional bump we hit, that that can open or tear our frequency. So I feel that my energy space was infiltrated from a very early age and that I had no tools or mechanisms because counseling or therapy, you just talk and talk and talk. It's like spinning your wheels in the sand. Mm -hmm. For me, it didn't get me anywhere. It didn't resolve the problem. Mm -hmm. And I'm sort of a bottom line girl, like, give me the solution. Let me do it. Give me a, a steps and, and, and let me tackle it. That's kind of what I, I wanted results. Right. And I was tired of that. So I think I carried grief, which is to me now, I like to call it foreign energy. Mm -hmm. It wasn't my vibration. So whether it was my dad's grief and depression and anger, 
um, that I embodied. Um, my family, you know, it was traumatic uh, upbringing. I uh, was an alcoholic father and, you know, an enabling mother and, mm -hmm. and, and, and all of those dynamics. And so, you know, grief of my grandfather, you know, I started to realize that I was communicating with the dead since a, as a teen. Mm -hmm. My grandfather came to me when I was camping and said, you know, I'm, I'm leaving. And he showed me that he was taking one path and I was going on another. And I'm like, oh, okay, what am I going to wear to the funeral? Like I was, I was already perceiving and receiving messages that my family poo-pooed. Like there was no validation that I was tuning into this. So I think for a lot of years, even that, all that repressed um, emotion or information will create dysfunction, dis-ease, and then death. You know, death of our dreams, death of our careers, death of our relationships. And that's one of the big messages that I brought back from my NDE. So as, as I started to release that grief from that, you know, it was funny because I, I went to a lot of different psychics and a lot of different healers. I went to shaman or a holy men in Egypt, and I reached far and wide trying to find out what happened to me. Because in 1998, we didn't have a strong internet and books and organizations. And, you know, I mean, Dr. Raymond Moody was one of the books and Brian Weiss, they had done written some early books. But other than that, there wasn't much resource, right? right? right. And, and therapy or the counselors, you know, I was afraid to go to a therapist. I'm thinking they're going to lock me up and throw away the key. Right. <laughs> Give me some medicine. You know, and I was totally opposed to that. And keep in mind that when my dad passed and then I was divorced, this was six years before, seven years before, and then I was diagnosed with a life-threatening illness. To me, that was all a mini death because my life fell apart mm -hmm. and I was reinventing myself. And, and there was no information on healing chronic fatigue. I did it the long, hard way, the trial and error method, organic and acupuncture and meditation on the beach and yoga which is what they're telling people today, right? Yeah, but yeah. that's how I healed myself. That's Then I was yearning that something, that missing link, and that's what took me to Egypt. But again, you know, I was trying to heal and understand that those foreign energies are what made me sick. They're what broke up my marriage. They're what, you know, I wasn't able to let go of. Hmm. So I, I um, sometime about, about a year after, the actual physical Egypt experience is when I started to download where I went and where I was accessing information that I believe I went into the Akashic records because I was, when, when I, I reached, after I blacked out, I reached a threshold where I literally, my body, physical body melted and they showed me I was a glowing light and I had the guide behind me that was a pure light and said that I was going to have a tour of the all. I couldn't stay, but I could have, you know, a tour. Mm -hmm. The first place we went, it was almost like I was riding on this bird's back. That's how it felt, like just a smooth, glided, easy transition. And I reached this state of perfection and it and it was a building and they showed me like a boardroom and there were 12 people there that looked identical they weren't male and they weren't female and they had these glowing heads and they sat around this big table and their heads opened it was almost like a lid from a teapot opening and these bright golden lights shone right into my the center of my head and nobody said anything. And they said, you can access anything you want to know anytime you have access. And then I was catapulted out of that space into what I believe was the Hall of Records. And it didn't come to me that that was, I mean, I, I had the picture in my mind for years, but it didn't come till just a few years ago. Oh my gosh, Hall, Hall of Records mm -hmm. that they talk about in Egypt. Because all it was was an, an infinite hallway with doorways on, on the right and on the left. And my guide said to me, you may enter whatever door you, you, you choose. 
it's it's free reign. So I chose the easiest right door on my right was a gold door. And when I say I walked into it, it was like I floated into it. I just merged into it. And it, and merging into it, I was like, well, where am I? What is this? And I heard my guide say, this is the fabric of all creation. Now I say guide. I also want to say God. I want to say the all. It was it was a presence and a power all at once that was and and what it felt like and what I visualized was a morphing, moving kaleidoscope of colors and patterns mm -hmm. that I was part of. I lost myself in these patterns and all of that. And I said, well, what is this besides the fabric of all creation? And I heard this is love. And it was warm and it was contained and it was power and it was beyond anything worldly or earthly that I can articulate pro properly. Mm -hmm. And of course, I didn't want to leave. It felt like being in the womb of our mother. Mm -hmm. You know, if we could try to remember what that might feel like, you know, truly yeah. amazing, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then just as I was loving it and feeling it and feeling the just so amazed, whew, I got thrown out. <laughs> I'm like, that's rude. <laughs> there I was in the corridor again. And then I was, I walked across the corridor into this pink door and I merged into what felt like I was stepping into an emerald. It was still, it was more opaque. There was no movement. It was absolute pure stillness. And I said, well, what's this? And they said to me, actually, they didn't say. They showed me my timeline from birth to where I was. And they showed all my emotions that I had tucked away within my being were all sort of a ripple and triggers that caused my physical illness and all my problems, my emotional challenges, my uh, physical ill health, hmm. all of it was had an emotional component. And then I started to understand that I, my job was to detoxify those emotions and those stuck patterns, that that was the secret. And they explained to me, on that detoxing the physical body was the most important thing for my physical body and that the emotional and spiritual and mental detox were equally important. And they explained to me that everything was energy and that I needed meditation was critical in understanding and connecting with this fabric of all of creation, which was love and to keep the energy moving to create that balance and to manifest that that was the secret. It wasn't about, um, you know, doing more or working harder or some of the other, you know, belief systems that we have mm -hmm. that my job and my mission was to guide people and myself first heal or heal thyself mm -hmm. of that. And to share this message carrying forward that that's our responsibility. This is our purpose is coming into alignment with that flow, with the, 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 the patterns of the universe, recognizing we are not separate. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I've spent the last 24 years um, integrating that, practicing that, teaching that, helping others understand, you know, where are they derailed and uh, seeing you know, the, where we, the seed of that, you know, when we were young, when we were so influential, uh, influenced, well, strongly influenced, is, is that's where the, the seeds begin. And so I started to, my, my vision had shifted radically where I could see things that other people couldn't see. That's what, when I came back from the NDE into my world in San Diego, I couldn't function normally. It took me quite some time to start to understand that I had to turn down my clairvoyance. I had to turn down the clairaudience and I had to learn how to manage my energy centers so that I could work them like a dial 
on, mm. on a computer or in like a cockpit of an airplane, right? And that's what nobody's really been teaching us, um, that we are energy beings. And so we've got to learn how to use those controls to function. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. grief is, in my choice of words, stuck energy. And when that stays stuck, it creates dysfunction and dis-ease. And so in simplifying it, not demonizing it, or, you know, I, I facilitate within my own space and with others tools that can quickly get that moving, right? We don't want to stay stuck in it because we could talk about it till the cows come home, you know, it's like that it just doesn't, in my estimation, get us to where I want me to where I wanted to go faster. We'll get back to grief to growth in just a few seconds. Did you know that Brian is an author and a life coach? If you're grieving or know someone who is grieving, his book, Grief to Growth, is a best-selling, easy-to-read book that might help you or someone you know. People work with Brian as a life coach to break through barriers and live their best lives. You can find out more about Brian and what he offers at www.grieftogrowth.com, www.grief, the number two, growth.com, or text GROWTH, G-R-O-W-T-H, to 31996. If you'd like to support this podcast, visit www.patreon.com slash grief to growth, www.patreon.com slash G-R-I-E-F, the number two, G-R-O-W-T-H, to make a financial contribution. And now, back to grief to growth. Mm-hmm. Wow. So that's, that's fascinating. So when you had your NDE, it sounds like it was still quite a while later when you started having the downloads of all the information that you learned. Is that correct? It was about a year. See, what I now understand is I had to work out that energy, mm -hmm. whether it's something that, that I carried within my frequency from my own previous you know life um or whether it was something that i picked up in egypt some dark energies and uh, they call them the jinn you know um or whether it was from the airport you know wherever we go we're, we're receptive if i'm so vulnerable and wide open after having that experience i went so far out of my body and that's there's no question that my body shut down so if i was so wide open I, there's a high likelihood that i brought in extra stuff right i mean i was screwed up bad and <laughs> I had my own baggage, but, um, you know, there, it's just, we could, you know, there again, you know, speculation doesn't really solve it. Yeah. There was, there was a lot of foreign energy. Interfering. Yeah. Well, it's not uncommon after people have NDEs to go through a, a difficult time coming back for, for whatever reason, people, I heard you mention like, where was, where was Jesus in my NDEs like that? And I've heard people say, I felt like I was rejected. You know, I was, there I was in heaven. Why didn't I get a chance to stay? Um, people can be depressed about coming back to this world. Oh. This world is tough. And, and depression is stuck energy. Mm -hmm. And so the, the very, very, yeah. So depression. And I, and also in my understanding is many people develop super, super powerful healing abilities mm -hmm. and vision or psychic abilities get cranked up. And if we don't have any tools or ways to understand it, we, we shut them down, which makes it worse or yeah. fear about it based on our religious programming um, or families. Yeah. I went back to my family and to tell them how much I love them. I mean, my heart was so wide open and I just got pretty much slapped down. And my mother said to me, you know, well, if you'd stop going to all those exotic places, you wouldn't die. And I mean, that was the mindset I was dealing with. So, yeah. so that would shut you down. And, um, but yet my spiritual abilities, my, my superpowers wanted to come out loud and strong, which mm -hmm. we all have you know, and we've just been repressed. So yeah, that wanted to come out. And the other thing is I've noticed a lot of people on the path or after they've had this start to change their, their relationship with money. Have you noticed that? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think people, a lot of people, sometimes people in the, to become less materialistic, less concerned about, you know, worldly things. That's, that's very common also. Yeah, so it becoming more, you know, connected with the heart and each other and mm -hmm. understanding the value of having this life and 
And, uh, well, you know, I, I still struggle with my sensitivities and really have to work hard to keeping clear so that I am a clear vessel. I take that, you know, with a high level of responsibility. Yeah. That's my job. Yeah. There's, there's a real balance of, of being a human being, you know, having this physical body, but also having that spiritual aspect. And, you know, a lot of times I, I, I do interview a lot of people who've had NDEs and people say to me uh, who haven't had NDEs, I really wish I could have an NDE. And I'm like, no, you, it could be tough. <laughs> it could be tough. It's tough on your body. It's tough on your psyche. There's, there's depression that's associated with it. A lot of times coming back. Um, why am I, why am I still here? You know, is a, is a common thing. And then, you know, PMH Atwater says it takes an average person, an adult, seven to 14 years to integrate the experience. And for people that haven't had one, they don't really understand how, how it just blows your mind. It blows up your world. You know, it really blows up your, your, your relationship with 3D, right? Yeah. yeah. Right? So and try I, to re, yeah, reintegrate. Yeah. Yeah. PMH at Water. She's done amazing work, hasn't she? She has. Yeah, she has. And as you said, in 1998, we didn't, we didn't have all this information and people weren't open about NDEs. So in, now people have them. I think they're not much more likely to share them because everybody knows about it. But back then you didn't share because people would think you were, you were crazy. And so here's the thing, I bring back a message that we can access all of those things that so many people talk about in their NDEs through healthy, um, using tools that can help release the blocks, you can turn on your spiritual abilities very easily. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't have to do the NDE to sort of get your cosmic awakening, you know, I call I it. I know you, you you have a master's in uh, metaphysics. Tell me what that's about and where did you get a master's in metaphysics? Uh, it was the University of Sedona. Okay. And I'm, I'm working on my, my dissertation. So i um, working on that PhD, right, as we speak. So I'm excited about that. But um, yeah, so I've always had a curiosity. Even as a raised Catholic, I would secretly try and find books or information on, on the occult, right? The hidden or the unknown or the secrets. I've always had a fascination. Never really retained it or or kept it, but just secret little studies. Mm -hmm. So I was on a spiritual path or seeking since my early 20s. So it's been over 40 years. And I remember taking a training in my early 20s called The Master Key to Riches. It was actually a book that Napoleon Hill worked, or um, he created his book from the teachings of this. I think uh, Wallace Waddles uh, wrote some of this, these teachings from the ancient long time ago. But then I realized I've been to Egypt now 13 times. And I've, I'm wor working on a group we're going in October. And I think the ancients, what they're te they teach is metaphysics, is the principles of alchemy and, and transformation, understanding th that we are one and we're, everything is connected and energy flowing is, 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 the, is the power behind healing of all healing. So I've yeah. always had a fascination. So speaking of healing, tell me what quantum healing is. I know that you're, uh, that's something you're interested in. Well, and I didn't have the words for that from my NDE when I started to understand and understand that I could see the energy. Mm -hmm. And then later it came to me with uh, Deepak Chopra and he started, you know, I had read his books, but I didn't put, join the dots that, oh my God, I am seeing the energy. And because I can see it and move some whatever I do with my mind, that that is redirecting the quantum field. And so I coined the term and used it way long time ago. And now I'm hearing more and more people saying they're doing quantum healing. Fascinating to me, but it's basically using my clairvoyant abilities to see the energy. Mm -hmm. And so I was reflecting on a client of mine, and it was a, a royal princess from Dubai. And when she contacted me, she um, didn't tell me what who she was, first of all. She didn't tell me what she wanted. And the long of it, short of it, after about six, approximately one hour sessions, I was able to identify and release the energies from her mother. And also I remember seeing what happened to you at 18 years old. I, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. This woman wanted to get pregnant. Mm. She had three children, 
all with in vitro fertilization. She was told by doctors she could never get pregnant naturally. So she was doing the IVF a fourth time to get pregnant because as a royal princess in the Middle East, that's their job. That's their role is to continue creating heirs. Mm -hmm. Okay, but when that doesn't happen, the husband has an option to get another wife. So this was a very important <laughs> pregnancy, okay? A reason to exist. So when I, when she contacted me, I'm like, oh my gosh, you want me to do God's work here? I mean, this is, this is pretty, you know, talk about putting the pressure on, right? Well, I just, you know, as nervous as I was and, and, and the prominence of this family was pretty significant. It made me all very nervous, concerned for my own well-being. And um, when, when I started to look at the energies and I could, spirit said to me, just do what you do, just see what you see. And, and I communicate that. And then I remove that. So I could see something happen to her at 18 years old. And I could see this block. I could, it was like somebody jammed a big old square peg in, in, a, in a hole and blocked her. And I could see that it cut off her creative flow, her baby maker, which is the second chakra energy of where we create from, that emotional space. Yeah, she, took, she was supposed to mar marry one guy and the family made her marry the prince. And she didn't want to marry him. So unconsciously, this woman literally shut down her reproductive organs. Wow. And after the clearing, she started reporting that husband's coming home early Friday. He had never done that in 15 years. And they're having their little escapades middle of the day. And I said, don't be surprised, honey, if you get pregnant before you start your next hormone therapy. Sure enough, she got pregnant naturally, delivered a happy, healthy baby boy. So I've got, I've got arms lengths of testimonies of people and, and demonstrating that, you know, we can heal the most absolute, you know, negative thing going on in our space um, with energy. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, that's, that's what gets me up in the morning is not making babies in a non-traditional way, but yeah. <laughs> is, is, is proving to ourselves, proving to me over and over and over that this is how you do it, yeah. <laughs> you know, just keeping the flow, whatever it is, whether right. it's creating a new business or a relationship or, you know, healing our physical body. Right. Right. So keeping that, keeping that energy flowing. Right. Well, you know, when you're in the zone, Brian, Yeah, yeah. how that feels. Yeah. You know, when you're on with your clients. Yeah. So I, I'm curious about your, your mediumship too, because you mentioned that you had some mediumship abilities before the NDE. And a lot of times people open up after the NDE. So did you see a change in your mediumship after the NDE? Well, I think I allowed it or I didn't have the, 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 let's say the boundaries or the, the wall. Like I was so ripped open, you know, I'm like on full blast. Like, um, I think all of the barriers and the, the taboos to seeing or sharing my stories, I had shut down with my family. Mm -hmm. And I think pretty much, you know, after my ND, I kind of slowly withdrew from my family. It's, it was sort of a progression of, of various things, but I think the biggest healing was stopping my connection with them because I had so much invested in, in being appreciated, being validated, being loved. Who doesn't? We all want to be loved by our family, right? Yeah. I think it's basic human nature. And when I, I was just never accepted, there was always something wrong with me, right? And so to me, that was a gift. It's a painful gift, Pete, to be honest. It's not a fun thing that I like to talk about. Right. I mean, I'm a Cancerian. That, your family's everything. So yeah. for me, it was like losing everything. But it also allowed the other parts of me that have been repressed to really come forward, for me to really be who I am, all of it. Yeah, you know. it's it's really unfortunate, but I'm I'm glad that you said that because I think people need to understand our families are you know we're born into our families. You know, as my wife says, we can choose our friends, but we can't choose our family. And a lot of times, our family will repress us. And I've I've interviewed several people that have had to make this very painful decision that for me to be me, I've got to step away from my family. Um, I, you're, you're not the first person I've talked to that's, that's, that's had to choose, choose this path because our, our families will want to hold us back. They want to put us in a box. Um, and it takes a lot of strength to say, I have to be me and you know, I have to, I have to do what and be true to myself. And 
you and that's that's the number one thing is taking care of yourself it would in from your perspective I, I admire that that you said it takes strength for me I saw it as weakness and I felt like I was there was something wrong with me but at the same time it was the most painful thing ever talk about grief yeah. is losing family when they're alive yeah. you know and I've even gone so far to say I don't have family mm -hmm. you know and that almost brings me to tears just to say it you yeah, know yeah. but that's the honest truth they're not there for me if I get real raw they weren't ever. I was there for them always to be, to do more, to love more, to give more for validation. Yeah. And, and it would never come because they just can't see me. After doing this work for over 20 years, my mother would continually say to me, please don't call yourself that. Like, isn't there another word that you can call yourself, not a psychic? Because, you know, for years, it's like a psychic sort of a catch-all term for a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And it kind of gets my goat in terms of marketing. It's like, I don't even know what the F I am, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I am, I'm a cosmic soul that's dancing. And mm -hmm. I can't just pick one thing that I'm really good at, right? Because the nature of spirit and the nature of flow is, and the more you open up, the more amazing you are with amazing abilities right right spiritual gifts knowing seeing hearing manifesting and healing yeah. it it becomes you become a rocket ship of all of this you know rocket fuel ready yeah. to blast off in any direction well i would say that you're a healer with many different tools I, i've talked to so many people that are that are like yourself who have who've studied this and studied this and you know you've got different tools so someone comes in they have an issue it might be a medium reading for one person they need to hear from a loved one for another person that might be stuck energy that they need to have moved around um so you've got you've got these different tools but people we all we do we want to put people in a box so what are yeah. you you know pick one yeah, yeah 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 i called myself the soul mystic Mm -hmm. Amira Hall and I registered that domain name over 24 years ago right mm -hmm. so yeah that's I'm the soul mystic and whatever shows up we work on and and it's it's always liberating it's always mind-blowing and I get many messages from from loved ones they come in they say hello yeah. and uh it's it's so heartwarming to know that we're not alone and our true family and those of maybe that we've never met in the body are on the other side of life. Yeah. And yeah. saying hello and reminding us for our wonderful abilities and to keep our hearts open and to be all that we can be. Yeah. Well, what you said, I, I appreciate you being so vulnerable. And I think it's really important because most of the people that listen to my program have gone through some sort of a grief event. And a lot of times grief it brings out, it, first of all, it makes us into different people. We can allow it, if we allow it to, it breaks us up and we become different people and then people get uncomfortable with us. And one of the, one of the surprising things about grief for, for a lot of people is the people that you thought were going to be closest for you, the people you thought were going to be there for you are not. They, they go away, they get uncomfortable. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the flip side of that, people that you had no idea were going to become close to you become even closer and they become, they become your family. And so I, I say anybody that loves you unconditionally, that's your family. Whether you're related by blood or not, it doesn't matter. It's so true, Brian. I remember when my gifts and abilities started opening up, I had friends that I had known for years that told me they could no longer associate with me because I was doing the work of the devil. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different ranges of, of you know, understanding that people have. And at that point, I was kind of like, okay, as you wish, one day you'll find out. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, yeah, and that's another thing that, you know, in the work that, that we do, uh, I, I got a few this morning. It's interesting because I, on my YouTube channel, I get these comments, this person's lying. This cannot possibly be true. They had an ND and they didn't mention Jesus. What do you mean? They said they went to heaven. They're Buddhists. They couldn't possibly go to heaven. Um, this is all, this is all Satan, you know, in, in disguise trying to trick you. You just and, want to swat the fly and make it go away. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, but I've, I'm at the point now I feel sorry for them. I really, I really do. Um, most of them, you can tell they're not, they're, they're not very well educated. I hate to say that, but the way that they write, you can tell they've been brainwashed by what or people they're stoned or something like that. Yeah. But they've been brainwashed into saying that the Bible says this. I'm, I'm, I'm a big advocate of the Bible. I've read the Bible. I've studied the Bible. I'm like, you're wrong. You're wrong about what the Bible says. So first of all, even if even if the Bible said that, then the Bible would be wrong, but it doesn't say that. The right. Bible doesn't say there's no NDEs or there's no afterlife or you can't talk to the dead. I've got some friends that are mediums, good friends that are that are very devout Christians that are mediums. Right. 
Well, in Christianity, you know, what, what's the prophet? You know, I mean, what's a saint? Yeah. They have yeah. messages. And I, I know that when I was working and living in Dubai, I, I was quite surprised because I found that the Islamic people, the whole population, first of all, they don't, you know, put down Christians. They, they embraced me mm -hmm. and they, they respected my abilities to a very high level. And honored me in ways that I never felt here in the West. In fact, they were more receptive to the quantum healing and to the non-physical world and me connecting with them than the Christian folks were here mm -hmm. over here in the West. So that really shocked me about how receptive they were and opened to the unseen world. Yeah. Um, and not afraid of it. Well, they don't like to engage with it because they re they respect it too much. They don't want to wake up up the demon, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it is fascinating, isn't it? And all of these uh, folks just are, are where they're at, right? Like maybe that person will wake. Why are they watching these channels anyway? Well, you know, that's a great question. It's funny you said that because just yesterday, I'm like, why are you watching this video? I, the video says, you know, John Davis takes a tour of heaven. That's one of the ones that is getting a lot of a lot of play right now. And I'm like, why are you watching it? You know, but, uh, you know, and it's funny because I have a friend and I interviewed her for my channel. She said several near-death experiences. She had a, an, yeah. a, a disorder where she was literally dying all the time. So I think she said like 18 NDEs or something. But I interviewed her and she said, you know, in the NDE community, she feels like, because she uses the term God, she's she's a devout Christian. And she goes, well, sometimes people don't like it when I use the term God. I'm like, we're just using different language for the same thing. Right, right. Yeah. I know. I, I, I appreciate that. You know, speaking of Jesus, you know, I was detoxing once. This was before my NDE. And I actually, I would, after I was, when I was diagnosed with chronic fatigue and I started on this campaign of detoxing, 30-day detoxes twice a year. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking intense detoxing. I was doing water fast for three or four days and I was on my bed. I was kind of weak that one point. And I remember just looking and staring into space and Jesus appeared to me mm -hmm. and he had his hands out. I only saw him from the chest up and he had his hands out like this to me. And I was so stunned and so shocked. And I'm like, oh my God, I would have had a list of questions that I know you were dropping in, you know, yeah, but, yeah. but you know, Jesus can appear when you least expect it doesn't have to happen in the NDE. Mm -hmm. And my thinking about the NDEs, I often thought, was mine an NDE or is it an OBE or is it this or is it that? You know what? Let's stop trying to, you know, pigeonhole it mm -hmm. and realize that the transformation, the messages and the teaching is where we're, we should really be focusing, not on, oh, Amira was smoking some good shit because that's how she got knocked out of her body. Excuse me, this lasted for nine months. Yeah, yeah. You know, this was not just a hit on some stupid joint, you know? Right, right. And so I get annoyed. And quite honestly, because of my story, I felt ostracized from the Indies. So a, a group of um, followings, right? Oh, oh no. it wasn't a real one w early in the day, right? Yeah. It's just like, oh, that wasn't a real one. Or, oh, if, you know, if unless you have a medical documentation that you died, right? You really didn't. And I'm like, they were asking me if my chest was bruised and pounded the crap out of me, right? Yeah. Trying to get the heart going. Okay, it's primitive, but that, <laughs> they do their best. <laughs> well, you're, you're absolutely right. And we do have these people that want to, you know, pick it apart. I remember listening and because I listened to them all the time and a guy, he was, um, he was on LSD and he had an NDE. So people might well say, well, how do you know it wasn't just a trip? How do you know it was, it was an NDE? But well, they're all trips. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, that's the thing. And, it, and I, I think there's, there's fascinating overlap between, um, I forgot the, the technical term, but for plant medicine. So when people do DMT and people do ayahuasca. I ayahuasca one time. Yeah. Well, three times down in Peru the year before. Oh, did you? Okay. Yeah. And, and, and so, okay, there's a fine line now as a clairvoyant and when I leave my body in meditation, how is that different? Mm -hmm. Because I go to some incredible places. I come back with messages from the celestial sanctuary, you know, where I go to get my information. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'm, when I'm least expecting, I'll get a visitation from St. Germain or somebody. Mm -hmm. So the more we're in alignment to these experiences, the more they happen. And I've been saying this for at least a decade now. You mark my word, we're coming into an era where 
many more of our spiritual abilities are going to get cranked up because many of us have been opening and paving the way. So if all of a sudden you're sitting on the sofa and you start hallucinating, and I had a guy come to see me a couple of weeks ago that had this very same, same thing. Mm -hmm. And it, and so we start thinking you just walked through the wall or you just saw a grandpa standing there in the corner and you turned away and then he's gone. This is going to happen more and more and more because the veil is thinning. And so people are going to be freaked out when they don't understand it or they don't, they can't control it and what to do. It's going to, it's going to rattle their cage, so to speak. Yeah, I, <laughs> so so I, I'm ready. <laughs> yeah, I do want to ask you, since you've had both experiences, how did the ayahuasca experience compare to your other experiences, whether it's the NDE or your other out-of-body experiences? Similar in different ways. Um, the first moment when I first went, Again, I had done a detox for 30 days before, so I was super clean. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know, first of all, I didn't know anything about ayahuasca. I was going on a trip to Peru. I had no idea what ayahuasca, this is 1997, no idea what I was doing or anything. But I cried on the plane all the way from San Diego to Lima, Peru. I sobbed like a baby. I had strangers holding me in the in the airplane and just consoling me. I wrote letters to my family because I felt like I was going to die. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was going to be an airplane crash or something. I just, I the whole, my whole body wouldn't stop sobbing. And so I was, you know, plugged in to this, this release of letting go of who I was am how I right. perceived myself all of that death was sort of like living the death right and call that grieving uh got to Peru we went embarked on the journey way, way in the Amazon when we started the journey they told me people are going to throw up and okay I didn't throw up um there was two other ladies they had done several journeys and I had not this was my first so everybody was vomiting violently. Okay, it's not a nice sound or, you know. I started to get a headache. And my head was, I thought it was going to blow up like an atomic bomb. Mm -hmm. It hurt so bad. And I was trying to contain myself and stay grounded and be present. Well, three shamans started praying over me and rattles and doing all their rituals, whatever. And, you know, I kept waiting for my head to crack open. It was just going to explode. And after about half an hour, all of a sudden, there was this black smoke that came out of my forehead. In that moment, I understood that there was a shaman that I was working with in San Diego, that he was plugged into what I call my pineal gland, my sixth chakra, center of vision. And he was hijacking my spiritual information for his own superpowers. And then I blasted that energy out. I later found out that the shaman did not want to conduct the ceremony because somebody was supposed to be going blind. And that person happened to be me. But it turns out it was, I was able to release that energy. Again, stuck energy seems to be my theme. Um, that energy that was foreign to me, that was hijacking my spiritual abilities, whew, got evaporated. And I knew in that minute, I could not associate with those people anymore. And then I had to cut ties, that they were not helpful for me and my, my growth. The next day in the next ceremony was when I had another vision of me coming through again, another, as I'm saying this, I'm seeing the theme. I was shooting like a shooting star through the cosmos, but I came through a diamond shape opening that I later called a portal. And I knew that I came to a place early Egypt. So it was part of the Egyptian, um, I guess, territory. I think it was in Byzantine time or Byzantine era where I came and that in that moment, I knew I was a star seed and I came to earth in, and I embodied in probably was like Iraq or the, the oh, Byzantine. God. That's all I knew. And I didn't, I wasn't curious. I didn't do any more research. I just left it there. I'm like, oh yeah, that's nice. Ooh, doo -doo, doo -doo. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what am I going to do with that? Like, okay, so big deal back in 1997. So I'm a star seed. I didn't, I didn't have anything to do with it. Right, it's just right. like, I didn't, I didn't attach my ego to that or, or make it a big thing. I, I, I honestly repressed it. Mm. 
Because, you know, I see people do, oh, I'm a star seed. Really? Get over yourself. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I have a bit of an attitude over that. Um, I just, and that that's really, I, there was no going back after that. After, yeah. after coming back to Egypt, I couldn't get a corporate job to save my soul. Every time I re reinterview for those, those jobs that I was previously doing, they would never hire me after the third interview. I'm just like, okay, well, okay, spirit, I get it. I get it. I'm supposed yeah. to be doing this work. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I think, I think these events, a lot of times put us, put us on our path, you know? So we, we, I, I believe the NDEs are, are tailored. I believe they're, they're tailored for the individual and you get what you need to get you back on the path that you were supposed to be on. And, and for a lot of us, it's, it's not, you can't go back to the other world. It's, and it's interesting you were saying that ayahuasca, when you were going to, to per, per, uh, Peru, you had this premonition like you were going to die. Because I've heard people compare an ayahuasca trip to death, that that it's like you you actually die. You you come back a different person than you were when you went into the experience. No question about that. So again, could it be like we weren't in an era then of the internet. I wasn't on some research. There wasn't the, the documentation. I was in my own little world right. and isolated, processing all this. and you know, savoring it or trying to forget it, you know, it's sort of both, both sides to that. Yeah. But over the years in communicating with a lot of deceased loved ones on the other side of life, I've come to the understanding that regardless if it's a near death experience and where we go and what we perceive, or whether it's a person that's left this world and they're in the other world, it's what our conscious, how we're able to develop our consciousness here that is what we take with us and or how we experience our NDEs. Right. That's my own sum, summer, summation is like, I remember connecting with this gentleman on the other side. This lady came to me and she wanted to have his, where, where is he? What's he doing? Mm -hmm. And all I could see him was in his woodworking shop. And he was just planing or lathing. I guess it's a planer. And he was just, he was like in, in this time loop, like a little gif, you know, or a gif. Mm -hmm. He was like in this perpetual little mini video. But he was stuck there. But that's his heaven. She goes, oh my God, he loved woodworking. So that was where he found his peace. That's where he found his connection to his heart, perhaps. And that was his idea of heaven. Yeah. And she was good with that. Yeah, and that that might be what he does for a while. You know, it's it's interesting. I right. try to <laughs> I try to integrate these things, right? So the OBEs, and I I have people I know people actually have really good friends with guys on the internet now who he does. Um, I guess it's called soul retrieval. But sometimes when people cross over, and I know this is controversial, people don't like to hear it. But sometimes when we cross over, we do kind of get stuck. We don't go to the place. We get stuck in between. And so there are people that on this side that will actually go help those people. Like okay. Let me connect you with your guides so you can so you can move on to the next level. So perfect example. I was just at a friend's. He lost his wife three month, uh, six months ago. And I've been to the home several times. And when I'd leave, I'd start, I would feel so depressed for three days mm -hmm. and have to go deep and like, what is that? Is that me? Is that what? What am I picking up here? Well, I was part meditating at the park just earlier this week, and all of a sudden I could see her. And she came to me and showed me she was in this perpetual setting the table in the in the in the dining dining room she was stuck in making sure all the place settings were right everything was perfect and i said to her well what are you doing she goes somebody's coming company's coming mm -hmm. and I'm like well who's coming who are who are you with and she could say she wasn't looking at me she kept looking at her setting and she kept saying well my aunt's over there so i thought well her parents and she's got other siblings and nobody's with her on the other side she's stuck setting the table in the home that I was always feeling depressed at when I went. Wow. So I'm thinking to spirit, well, and I don't know this woman and, and the gentleman doesn't talk a lot about her and what her traits were. So I said to spirit, well, what do I do? And so I opened the back door and I opened the front door and golden light just shone right and filled the house mm. and filled her and all of a sudden she went to the door and opened it mm. or like there was a crossover perception of that. Mm -hmm. And there was her family and everybody greeting her. Mm. And yes, she was stuck setting the table. She was stuck mm. in 3d. So I later asked my friend, did she have a spiritual or a, a, a you know, any kind of connection with Christ or Jesus or Christianity? He said, no, nothing. Her heaven, her 
her connection was making everything perfect in this right, life right. and having the table setting. She had no idea where to go or what to do. Right. And the family was all there. There was just no opening for her to connect with that vibration. Well, hopefully we'll see. It's only been three, four days. So um, hopefully everybody can move on and, and, and it's the process of her energy actually releasing so that people can take their yeah. next step. Well, that's why, you know, and body, sometimes, right? I, I think sometimes when people hear these kind of conversations, they might well go, well, so what, you know, but it's important that we understand this while we're here, because I, you said something really important, I think earlier, when we cross over, we take our, our perceptions with us. So if we're stuck to this plane, if we're stuck, if we're all, if we're all about whatever's going on here, and, and we're not ready to move on, we don't necessarily move on to that next phase until somebody comes to help us. It's what they call limbo. Yeah stuck in limbo or purgatory and i think that's the way that catholic faith talked about it but i've seen it like many people i've helped move to their next day yeah. well and it, because because when they're open and wide they'll they'll show up and they'll talk to me like it's it's amazing yeah. their deep wisdom and their connection and they're busy and they're learning and they're engaging with different things it's it's miraculous so and they're radically different. My ex-husband shot himself over the over the COVID uh, lockdowns and everything, and I tried to connect with him for a year and a half, mm. and not and I, I've gone to the place of being in gratitude with all of the times that we did share and things that I'm grateful for, mm -hmm. and he's starting to feel like and and he was definitely opposed to any any kind of this conversation. He was mm. somebody that was that was off his his wheel. Yeah, but he's definitely still stuck. And, and and I'm not, I guess I'm not the person to facilitate that, you know? Yeah, well, we can only do, you know, so much. And and we all have our own agency. And I think people, you know, the difference between, you mentioned purgatory, and, and I get in a lot of conversations with people about hell, because I, I deal with a lot of Christians. And the difference is God puts us there, you know, it's, it's because it's because of sin that we're, we're like, we're, we're placed there. I think it's the other, I think it's the opposite. I think sometimes we feel like we're not worthy to move on and we're scared of, of going over. So we, we actually put ourselves in these situations where it's like, I don't feel like I deserve to move on. I don't, you know, that's yeah, why we're being I, stuck in, in fear and all of our judgment to right. me, that's hell on earth. I mean, so yeah. you're going to, you're going to go there. Yeah. If you're feeling it here, nobody's going to forgive that. It's an inside job. Exactly. That's what I've understood. It's me. It's not anybody outside of me. When I had my review, it had nothing to do with what anybody was looking at the way I, well, how I treated anybody. It was how I treated me. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I we're gonna have to, to wrap up here. We're, we're oh my gosh, a yes, over we're an hour. It's yeah. gone really, really fast. So I want to give you an opportunity to let people know like how they can reach you. I know you've written several books, so talk about your books and your website and all that stuff. Okay. Yeah, I've written several books, Manifesting Miracles 101. It's really a guidebook. I wrote after or for my mentoring students to guide them along the process of clearing their channels and clearing themselves so they can have what they really are here to fulfill in their heart on every level. Um, recently released uh, The Essential Guide to Spiritual Awakening with a little bit of my story in there, but also the things as people are starting to wake up, what they need to look at and reflect on and how the signs are showing up for them and sometimes we we don't realize that it's all part of that spiritual journey that we're we're on that's mm -hmm. that's actually getting triggered my website is amirahall.com and i'm sure you'll put that in the yeah. description um and yeah i invite people i do virtual group sessions um once a month where you can find that on my website and i'm also launching next week i don't know when we'll post this but anybody can jump in it's a manifesting challenge so i will be it's not interactive I will be simply guiding people live for 30 minutes for five days in July, five days in August, five days in September. So to just get us revved up and rolling and keep flowing. <laughs> Thanks, Spirit. Um, and, and so, yeah, to manifest, manifest awesome. what's in your heart. Awesome. So people can reach out to you for, for mediumship or for yes. healing. Yes, like I healing. do have sessions on mm -hmm. my website. They can reach out to me for that and uh, just to chat and we can decide where to go with it. Sounds great. Well, it's been really wonderful getting to, to know you today. I do want to spell your name for people because I will definitely put it in the notes, but sometimes people are listening when they're walking or whatever. So it's Amira, it's A-M-I-R-A-H and it's Amira Hall. So there's two H's if it's amirahall.com. So you can find Amira there. So um, great to meet you and have a, a great rest Likewise. of your day. 
Oh, thank you so much. You're psychic yourself. You know that, right? <laughs> I've been told that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you are. <laughs> awesome. Thank you.